But once we've learned how to rest from our work, as I said, we need to learn how to take that rest other places. Taking a load off as God intends requires that secondly, you accept Christ's offer of rest at your work. That doesn't mean you pretend to work while you sleep, but it's taking that rest, as I said, again and again and again, to your workplace as an instrument of peace. The second part of the verses say this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're going to take his yoke, his work instrument upon ourselves. You see, the work, the yoke is a work device, a tool that brings many good things to our working environment. It makes work easier because the load is shared. It distributes the load between the two animals or fellow workers. But take his yoke. Again, we're talking about the work environment. It facilitates training as you're together. And you can imagine two animals. You could have a younger animal and a more experienced animal, an ox, let's say. Well, the younger says, I'll show this old guy uh, that I'm stronger, more powerful. I can work longer and harder than he. And so he starts out and he busts out with a surge of strength and pulling. And he's pulling not only the wagon, but he's pulling to some extent the old ox. And he says, ha ha, I'm really strong. This guy is nothing. But uh, then a few hours go by. Mm, he says, yeah, I'm still pretty strong, but uh, when are we going to quit? I didn't sign up for a whole day of work. Or you might say, I didn't sign up of a whole year or a whole li lifetime of following Jesus. I thought it'd be a little while and I'd go on my own way. No, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so it is that uh, the young ox begins to fade a little bit, wane. Well, about the halfway point of the day of work, the two are together. And uh, the young ox has his tongue out. <sighs> you know, this is hard. <sighs> and then the day proceeds, and the young is kind of dragging. And the old one is keeping the steady pace, which is now a pace that is faster than the younger. And he's pulling the younger along. And by the end of the day, the younger has learned a big lesson, that he's not as tough and strong as he thinks. He's been trained that it's for a distance that he must do, and he must reserve that energy. Many of us burst, many new Christians burst with energy, wanting to do everything for God. And before long, they're wore out and in the ditch, so to speak, with burnout. Jesus says, come and join me, and I'll train you together and develop teamwork. The sum total, the sum total of the parts is intended to be greater than the individual parts. It's called synergy. Where you come together and one ox or one person plus another person is not only two, but it becomes two plus, two and a half. Think for a moment uh, about soccer, or as they call it, football around the world. If you have two players going in against the goalie, it's greater than even two players. It's more like even three. If you have one on one, the goalie can defend more easily. But two players, he says, which one is going to get the ball? He passes it here. Okay, it's this one. So that's two players. One is passing. But that other path, one can either shoot it or pass it back. And two becomes actually more than even two players because the options just multiply. Well, so teamwork multiplies, not just adds, but multiplies our efforts. And that's what God wants to show us. And this teamwork and this device of working together enhances companionship. As we work together, we become friends. Some of the closest relationships are the result of hard times, maybe war times, where one soldier had to trust another, and they bonded 
My father was this as, as a pilot in World War II. And all through his life, he wrote to his fellow partners, his cabin crew, his flight group of about 10 on this plane. And one by one, of course, they died, and there's, I believe, two left. But every year he would go to a reunion, and these men would come together from all around the world, actually mainly America, but they would come together, and they would enjoy the bond that they had developed during hard times. Well, hard times can enhance our companionship if we work under Christ's yoke together. Resting at work requires that you change masters. Some changes are going to have to happen inside of us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We're going to have to be students of the Almighty Lord Jesus. The message says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Read again how Jesus worked. We never see Jesus running in the New Testament. He was moving right along at a right steady persuasion and purpose pace. Rest at your work requires that you change values. So often we have values that at the root of those values there's selfishness, selfish ambition. Ambition can be good where we take use of or make use of the opportunities that come our way, but ambition can be wrong when we step on others to get ahead and we won't accept being our best. We have to be the best better than anyone else. But one of the great values of the Christian life is humility. Humility is necessary for every person to humble ourselves. And no one who is more humble than the Lord Jesus. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. In St. Petersburg, Russia, there's a bridge. And like many places in St. Petersburg, there are statues. At one end of the bridge, we find that there's a horse and a rider, and definitely the horse has the upper hand as the rider is down below, almost being trampled or stepped on. And this horse, if you look carefully, and you're able to be there to see that its hooves are not shod, that is, it doesn't have shoes, and the blanket is not on, and the bridle is not held by the rider. This is a horse that is unbroken, a strong animal. But as you cross the bridge, you find that the statue is quite different. While the horse still has strength, the rider is now getting the upper hand. The horse is now shod or has shoes on it. A blanket is being placed upon its back. The bridle is being held. What's the difference between a horse that is broken and trained and one that is not? Is it a matter of strength? Not necessarily at all. But the difference between the broken horse, the one that is trained and the one that is not, is a matter of gentleness. Gentleness is not weakness, but gentleness is strength under control. Through humility, we enter a, of a state of mind where we are useful. We are not weaker when we're humble. We're not meek and weak, but we are useful in the hands of God. And He can steer us with limited pressure into right paths. Humility is said, or put this way, William Farley, the indispensable virtue that he calls humility. Humility is not self-hatred or lack of self-confidence. Rather, it is the ability to see yourself through God's eyes. A humble person increasingly sees himself as he really is, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Ironically, such humility lays the foundation for contentment and self or healthy self-esteem. In contrast, pride is spiritual blindness. Unfortunately, pride is also the sin to which we are caught most often and most blind. It is a demonic catch-22. Pride causes us to chase our own spiritual tales. I could not see my pride because I was full of it. Pride is a spiritual veil blinding us to the truth about ourselves. Those are sobering words. 
Pride is a spiritual veil blinding us to the truth about ourselves. We have to admit that we are in need of restoration, that we need the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ, and humility is the reason why, or the way, I should say, how we get to such recognition and rest amid, in amidst people. Resting at your work requires that you change agendas, change agendas. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, the message puts it this way. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything too heavy upon you or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Again, Oswald Chambers has this to say. As long as you have the tiniest bit of spiritual impertinence or pride, it will always reveal itself in the fact that you are expecting God to tell you to big, do a big thing. And all he is telling you to do is to come, simply come. Just this morning I read a devotional, a little devotional that I've appreciated over the years, Thoughts from the Diary of a Desperate Man by Walter Henriksen. And he speaks about wanting to do great things for God. He says, more often than not, what you seek to do for God will call the world's attention to you rather than to the one for whom you are doing it. Your heart may burst with love and devotion to Christ, causing you to want to do great things for him. This is only natural, and God accepts such expressions. But remember what he said to King Solomon, walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments. Nothing you ever do for God can act as a substitute for a life of obedience. So beware of wanting to do big things for God. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.